Thank you, choir. And George, thank you. Appreciate your leadership. We are looking at the letter of James and the um, sort of gathering theme for a series um, of five sermons that I'm doing related to the letter of James is get a grip. Get a grip on the things that are important that James wants to talk about. Um, Get a grip on adversity. Get a grip on well, today, temptation. And let's look together at verses 12 through 15 of the very first chapter. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one when tempted, should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. Those are wonderful words, aren't they? Everybody should be smiling now. Um, this may come as a surprise to you, but I was not a perfect child. In fact, um, I was uh, talking with Priscilla this week, and, and we were exploring our memories to see if we could identify some of those earliest memories of knowing that there was a line between right and wrong and knowingly crossing it. And um, I, I, I just know that from my first dawning awareness, I was already on the wrong side of the line. But there are some early memories that do come to mind. One of them in particular relates to, interestingly enough, the last time I got a spanking from my father. Now, I know that spankings are, are not as popular today as they were back in the day, back when I was a boy. But... Um, but um, my parents never left me permanently bruised, but they did leave reminders to, uh, um, again, remind me that I, I, there was a line and that I shouldn't cross it. But uh, we were living in Oklahoma City. It was during fifth grade, and as I've established in other stories from my past, I was an early bird. I got up even before my dad, who had grown up on a farm and was an early bird as well. But I was an early bird, and there was all kinds of opportunity in those early um, minutes and hours before the rest of the household was awake. As it so happened on a particular Saturday in the fall, while we were living in Oklahoma City, and I was in fifth grade, um, a friend of mine and I, down the street, a friend, Robert Colbert, and I came up with this great idea. He had heard about the possibility of newspaper route and that we could make some money. And, and so we decided we were going to go and talk to one of those newspaper um, dispatchers, distributors, who drove around the truck to drop off the big bundles for the various mail carriers. And so early in the morning, before anyone else in the house was awake, I got my bicycle out, and I rode down the street, met up with Robert, and we rode off on our bicycles to meet this newspaper dispatcher. I knew that had I asked my parents for permission, they would have said no. So that's why I didn't ask them. Um, you know, better to get forgiveness than uh, permission is the old saying. Well, this was one of my early lessons in that regard, and I'm here to say that that's not always true. When I got back from that trip, my whole household was out on the driveway. My dad was pacing. Um, my mom, who was the scariest one was at all, uh, of all, seemed to have steam coming out of her ears, and it was at that moment it dawned on me again that this was the day we were to get in the car and drive off an hour and a half away for a football game between Oklahoma State University and Nebraska. 
Oklahoma State being my dad's alma mater. They were wondering where in the world I was, caught between genuine concern for my well-being and anticipated anger because they knew I probably wasn't uh, somewhere in danger, but more likely somewhere I shouldn't have been. Dad brought me into the garage where I could drop off my bicycle, reminded me that we were now late, and then left another reminder behind for the experience. And when I say behind, I use that knowingly. It is not easy being good. Kermit may have had a hard time with being green, but being good is even more difficult. John Piper, um, author and pastor, has said, Sin remains powerfully and suicidally appealing. You remember in... Um, in his letter to Roman Christians, Paul writes in chapter 7 about his own struggle with sin, how the very things he wants to do, he doesn't do. The things he doesn't want to do, those are the very things he ends up doing. He wrings his hand and says, who will save me from this body of death? There is something at work in me. Well, he also writes in that same book, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I have yet to meet anyone who asks to be excluded from the roll call. <laughs> Ever since the serpent waylaid Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, temptation has been a fact of life. And I would go ahead and point, uh, draw your attention to the statue that's on the altar this morning. Priscilla and I brought that from home. Uh, and, and you can take a closer look when, when um, the opportunity presents itself after worship or as you're coming forward for communion because it is a statue that takes us back to the misty dawn of humanity within creation. Adam and Eve, back to back, an apple in Eve's hand held out to Adam and Encircling them is that serpent. Ever since that moment that's captured in Genesis chapter 3, temptation has been a fact of life. Every one of our senses tingles with enticements to sin. We see, we hear, we taste, we touch, we want. What are we to make of it? And what are we to do about it? Well, um, let's contemplate the wisdom of James. For one thing, says James, let's don't fall prey to the blame game. Don't point fingers at God, says James. For James is not, for God is not tempted. And God is not the one who has tempted us. And then he moves on into a more accurate description. But isn't the temptation to blame almost irresistible? Think back to the story as we have it in Genesis chapter 3. When after the forbidden fruit has been eaten, despite the admonition of God that you can have any of the fruit of the trees, Enjoy the Garden of Eden for all it's worth except for that one tree and its fruit. The fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of that you shall not eat. They eat it anyway. Their eyes are opened. And now God, later in the day, walking in the cool of the evening, confronts them, wondering why they're hiding and what's going on. Interesting. Is it not? You know, the, the reality of that moment is that um, it had started with Eve seeing it, the whisper of the serpent offering a counter story to the one that uh, God offers. And now they're standing before God naked and ashamed and what's the first thing that happens? God speaks to Adam and he says, The woman that you 
gave me. Blame number one. And the woman, <gasps> the serpent, the serpent. And unfortunately, the um, serpent has no finger to point with. And, and that's the end of the blame game that particular day. How easy it is for us to play the blame game. And, and I was thinking about that this week because um, one of the f favorite, th um, most popular and omnipresent explanations that comes when we get caught in our anger or being upset is a, uh, is a phrase like this. You make me so angry. Or they made me frustrated and I reacted. And that just amounts to blame. Because here's the reality. There is between stimulus and response this very powerful thing called choice. And it doesn't matter how influential the people or forces or desires in our lives are, those are simply stimulation. And they do not make us do anything. Between stimulus and response, between opportunity and decision, is a choice. And the choice is ours. And we hold responsibility for it. James makes it clear here that that is the case. By the way, that statue, bringing us into that moment, actually has a title that reminds us of this truth. Because the title of that statue is, He Could Have Said No. James depicts what's really going on in uh, the sequence of things. And I love the way um, Eugene Peterson, the author of the paraphrase of the Bible, the message, puts it. And he, by the way, just passed away this last week. We are grateful for his life and his witness and all the ways he influenced. But here's how he puts the description. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our lust. Lust gets pregnant and has a baby, sin. Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. Graphic, isn't it? James' answer to the question of why, why it's so hard to be good, why does temptation prove so irresistible, is the explanation of how this thing works in our lives. Evil desires, the human hunger, a ceaseless factory of desires. We see it, we like it, we want it, we think we must have it, we convince ourselves that the risks are worth it, we rationalize away the consequences that others have suffered and the testimony of time, desire wins the battle. And winning the battle drags us away. Resistance is lowered. And the battle between better judgment, unbridled desire ultimately becomes a losing battle and desire wins. This is an internal battle, a wrestling match between good and evil that's in us, but the good doesn't often put up much of a fight. We see and we want, and we go for it. And then it's only in the aftermath that the consequences come. It's interesting what happens here, a kind of um, birthing that takes place in the choice, usually a kind of exciting moment, eagerly awaited, but in this process what's born isn't a little bundle of joy, it's a little holy terror. 
And it's interesting, um, I remember studying the seven deadly sins uh, in preparation for a sermon series I did a few years ago. That One of the authors I was reading made an interesting point. He said, stop and reflect about the, the seven deadly sins. Uh, pride, lust, envy, greed, gluttony, sloth, anger. And uh, contemplate that only one of those seven deadly sins doesn't at some level have a positive payoff. Virtually all of them offer something and there is the initial benefit that comes. It's sort of our version of the story of eating the forbidden fruit. Just as Eve tastes it and it is good and her eyes, just as the serpent said they would be, are opened and she is now able to see. There is a payoff that initially seems positive. And you and I can reflect on our own choices in life and see how that is true. Only one doesn't have a positive payoff, and it's envy. The slant-eyed, green-eyed envy is always made miserable by the good things that occur in other people's lives. We can't imagine that they deserve it. They wonder why anybody doesn't see what they see. They cannot enjoy another's happiness because it steals from their own lack of happiness. And they find pleasure only when they can bring others down to their level of misery. The payoff for all of them, though, is short-lived because, as James takes note, there is a birthing that comes with sin, and what is born is death. It has its own legs. It grows to full maturity. The consequences of sin unravel, and we find ourselves either busy in cover-ups or running for our lives or hiding our heads in shame. The troubles that come remind us of the truth of Scripture that once born, sin takes on a life of its own, grows, develops, reaches maturity, and gives birth to death. It poisons and kills relationship, opportunity, joy, life. It introduces complications, wave upon wave. It leads to interminable regret. The interesting thing about this brief text, though, is that, God, uh, that James doesn't just offer us the diagnosis of sin and the way it works. He does more than just um, tell us how it happens. He also offers a solution. He offers a word of hope. And you can look at those first verses of that text in, in James chapter 1 to, to see these little pieces of what he offers in, uh, in response to that. The first of these is, is, is love. There in verse 12 where he says um, this is a promise to those who love him. And the invitation to us as a counterpart to temptation is to love God deeply enough to trust and obey, to want to do what pleases God. And if we cultivate a loving relationship with God, we will find a mutuality in that love that changes what we want out of our love for God. And we will find ourselves wanting what God wants. We will find ourselves trusting God, even at those points where what we want is different and is powerful. We will still trust God in those moments. Um, the pursuit of joy, writes one author, the pursuit of joy in God breaks the power of sin. I know of no other way to triumph over sin, he writes, long term, than to gain a distaste for it because of a superior satisfaction in God. James, uh, Jesus puts it this way in John chapter 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's more, too. We can, 
says James, look at temptation in a particular way. See it not as an enticing, irresistible opportunity, but see it instead as a trial, as a test. It's a matter of perspective here. It's a matter of how you see what's happening when temptation comes. Temptation isn't opportunity knocking. It's the adversary, the tempter trying to steer us away from God, from life. He's testing us to see if we'll cave. He's exploring our defenses, looking for points of weakness, searching. There was, uh, in a recent storm along the coastlines, a levee where flooding broke through because the pressure of the currents found the weak spot in the levee and poured over it. The tempter is just like that in our lives. We'll look for the weak place in the levee of our soul and push through. And that's where seeing temptation for what it is, we can resist. Don't focus on temptation's promises or pleasures. Focus on what's really going on. And then, says James, resist. In James chapter 4, verse 7, in fact, he goes on to say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Put up a fight. Tell temptation to take a flying leap. We don't have to be victims. We don't have to roll over and play dead. Jesus, again, actually offers us a model when we contemplate after 40 days in the wilderness the tempter coming to him and how he responded to the tempter famished thirsty temptation to have bread and Jesus calls on scripture three times in response to three temptations we could do that too one of the many reasons to have Scripture at our disposal is that we can call on it because it offers us truth that we can speak back to temptation. Jesus knew the scriptures by heart. He quotes Deuteronomy three separate times in response to the temptations. He called it to mind. He declared it with confidence. And I'm here to say I've tried it and it works. Claimed the scripture. And claimed their strength. Knowing that God has put his power at our disposal. And that we can persevere. We persevere in the strength of the spirit. Jesus said, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And we can call on that. As a reminder that when all is said and done, the last and best bit of good news is the word grace is the grace of God who forgives us and unchanges us from the unchangeable past of the sin that holds us in his grip and sometimes keeps us in the way of sin because we think we're stuck now in response to that we have these words in 1 John chapter 1 verse 19 chapter 1 9 If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is God's grace. This is God's words into your life and mine. We do not come here this morning as people pure of heart and mind and life. All of us, to a person, have areas of our lives that are not under God's sway. There are some of us who have come this morning having crossed some line in the invisible sand and we are filled with guilt and we may even think we are stuck. And the word of the gospel is we are not stuck. God's love in Christ liberates us and we can be free. God removes the shackles of sin and says your life is new. But then grace expresses itself furthermore this way. It is the spirit of the living God 
The very Spirit who forgives and cleanses is the Spirit who walks with us, indwells within us, empowers us. It is not in our own strength that we resist. It is not in our own strength that we trust and obey. Paul's already declared the defeat that comes that way. No, it is the Spirit alive within us, the Spirit of the living Christ, who, if we will but tend to the relationship, listen and respond, will guide us along the way. I've come a long way since that time when I was fifth, uh, fifth grader, riding off on the bicycle against what I knew were my better wishes. And I have become much more sophisticated in the ways of the world. I'm here this day to declare that the good news of Jesus Christ is the power that is the answer to it all. Let's pray to the one who is alive and well for the life he calls us to lead. Heavenly Father, we do indeed want to get a grip on temptation and we thank you for your love that's unconditional for the grace by which you've forgiven us and the promise of your ongoing presence in us may we your people being transformed into your way look to you as the power of our lives in the name of jesus christ we pray Amen.